Hey guys, this is Manish Sethi and thank you so much for visiting my site from Get Rich Slowly. So I recently got to sit down with Leo Babauta of ZenHabits.net, one of Time Magazine's top 25 blogs. And Leo told me an amazing story, we had an awesome conversation and he explained to me how he's become a completely different person. He used to be overweight, he used to be deep in credit card debt, he used to be a smoker. But today, he's one of the most fit men I've ever met and he also managed to get out of credit card debt to quit smoking and he did it while holding three jobs and taking care of six kids. And he did it by building new habits. In our interview, he explained to me the exact process that he used, the exact actionable steps that he followed to make this change occur. And, uh, and he's allowing me to release this interview to, to Get Rich Slowly readers. So exclusively for you guys, I'm gonna give you early access to this interview. Just go ahead and scroll down to the bottom of the page right now Pause the video if you'd like, and you're going to see a, uh, a form. Just fill out the information, hit the submit button, and you'll get the, the other interview with Leo about to email to you instantly. So do it right now, and when you get back, we'll get on to the interview with J.D. Roth. Thank you guys so much. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to ManishSafety.com, and I'm here today with J.D. Roth of the blog Get Rich Slowly. Um, Get Rich Slowly is one of my favorite fi personal finance blogs. Um, most of you know that my brother is Ramit Sethi, who's also in the personal finance space. And it's really interesting to get to see uh, lots of different perspectives on personal finance and um, on excellent blogging tactics. And I've been talking with JD. I'm here in Portland um, visiting JD and a few other people. And yesterday we went out and we had an amazing conversation about really cool stuff. And um, JD, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit to, my, to the readers? Sure. Well, hey, I'm J.D. Roth, and uh, as Manish says, uh, I write at getrichslowly.org, not .com, .org. Uh, and we can talk about whether you should get a .org or a .com for your blog. And uh, I've a, I'm a lifelong resident of the Portland area, and uh, yeah, it's great to have visitors from down south. <laughs> so J.D. Uh, actually was one of Time Magazine's top 25 most influential bloggers last year, mm -hmm. and uh, it's amazing to see like somebody that I've been following since the since many years ago get up to that rank um, and it was, it was so anyway I wanted to ask JD a few questions and I know that a lot of you guys had a, a lot of questions about personal finance and about building a, a successful blog um, so JD uh, tell me a little bit about like your blogging method like how many posts do you write a day what kind of posts do you try to write okay well my method has changed uh, over the years uh, First of all, I've been blogging for a long time. Uh, I've been blogging since before blog was even a word. I started uh, keeping a web journal in 1997 uh, to chronicle my weight loss, my attempted weight loss. And uh, uh, I started a personal blog in 2001 and uh, that eventually morphed into a personal finance blog. So along the way, I've had a lot of uh, different ways of blogging. And uh, it used to be that I would just, I would write when I felt like writing and I would post and that was it. And so sometimes I would post eight, nine, ten times a week. Sometimes I would post once a week. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started Get Rich Slowly, I continued that pattern. I just posted rather irregularly. But it grew really quickly and I had an audience and I felt this obligation to the audience and I felt like, oh my gosh, I, I've got to produce content. People are reading. I've, I've got to put content out there. And so I got into this habit where for a long time I thought I had to post twice a day and then once a day on weekends. So I had to do 12 posts a week. and. Uh, it's a lot of pressure to do 12 posts a week. How long were each of these posts? Well, it depended. I mean, when I was doing 12 posts a week, I gave myself permission to have shorter posts. So some of them would be maybe 200, 250 words. But most of them were like now where I'm doing about 1,000 words a post. Mm -hmm. And uh, But what I found is, you know, I would aim for the, the 12 posts a week and then I would I'd feel really bad. Like, oh my gosh, I've only put up 10 this week. I'm a failure. And uh, so I decided to change my perspective. Uh, this was in... 2008, I think, I said, okay. I actually sat down and I thought about this because I was feeling bad about blogging. And I thought, what can I do to feel better? And I said, uh, all right, I'm gonna aim for one post a day and uh, maybe do weekends. So that gave me, I was giving myself permission to do just five or seven posts. And the reality of the situation was I, I kept producing the same amount as I was producing before, which was about 10 posts a week. But instead of feeling like a failure because I didn't get 12, I felt good because I was getting five or seven. So, yeah. I mean, I was, uh, I was aiming for five or seven, but getting 10. So you were setting your standards lower to achieve, yeah, to achieve better. Yeah, I know. But it worked. I mean, yeah, it was a psychological trick. It worked. It, it worked. And at the end of the day, like 12 posts is a lot of posts. Yes, so yes, 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 yes. And so now, I mean, 
we're further on than I was in 2008, uh, you know, three or four years later, um, Get Rich Slowly has become sort of a business. It is a business. There's no question that it's a business. And I feel like I've said a lot of what I've, I've had to say for the Get Rich Slowly audience, and there are other audiences I want to explore, so I'm writing in other venues. And so a lot of my writing energy is going there, but I still want to provide content for the people who read Get Rich Slowly. So I've brought in additional writers. There are staff writers at Get Rich Slowly who produce content. Mm -hmm. So we still aim, we want to have a, a post every weekday, sometimes tw uh, two posts, and uh, one post on Sunday. But uh, there are staff writers, I'm writing, I'm only aiming for one post a week now, and sometimes I do two or three. Okay. And then I've also, what's been really valuable for me is to go towards reader-generated content. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean every Friday, most Fridays, I try to have a reader question. So, uh, somebody's sending a question about how to hi handle their finances. Should they pay off their mortgage, for example? And so I'll respond with uh, my feelings on it, my uh, opinions, and then open it up for reader discussion. The readers love it. And then every Sunday, uh, I post a reader story, a story that a reader has sent in about how they've handled their finances, how they've been successful, how they failed. And uh, to me, uh, from what I can tell, this is the, the feature the readers actually like the most, is reading what other readers are doing. Not what I, I mean, Interesting. They've, they've had enough of what I've <laughs> done with my money. That they want to hear what other people are doing. And this is actually, I think, going to be the uh, launching point for uh, my next book, is what other people do with their money. That's really interesting. We'll talk a lot about your other, your other venues and your, other, uh, and your books soon. Um, but I'm wondering, like, from, for like a reader who's just, for a new blogger, somebody who's just started, mm -hmm. you told me that you, when you first launched your blog, you basically had, most of your readers were friends and family who Correct. were coming from your other blogs. Um, I'm interested in knowing exactly how you got from, you know, 2002 to 2006. Like, how did you go from barely any readers on your blog to suddenly having over over 500,000 uniques that like that is really interesting to me so what kind of like organic growth and what kind of like marketing methods did you use to get it up there well first of all as we talked about last night I am the world's worst marketer your brother Ramit is man might be the world's best marketer <laughs> I, I'm the polar opposite I'm not a very good marketer I'm not good at self-promotion um, so for me the way I have uh, gone about growth first of all I'm very much a person who believes that content is king. I mean, that's kind of old school, I know, to say content is king, and a lot of people say, no, no, you gotta do the SEO, this, that, the other thing. But for me, content is king. I've always been about the content. I wanna produce content. And uh, it's not just producing information that will help people, but I like to tell stories. I think it's very important to tell stories because people relate to stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, it gives them some sort of uh, a reference point to, to understand, oh, this is how I could implement something in my own life, or. Uh, whatever. So as far as the actual growth goes, um, when I started Get Rich Slowly in 2006, it was April 15th, 2006, most of my readers were family and friends. But I was fortunate that uh, because I've been on the internet for a while, I had some uh, moderately influential uh, readers, I mean, and friends, people who uh, ran other sites and uh, who were familiar with my writing and they started reading the blog and they'd mention it. And then I was an active member of other communities, certain other communities. For example, I, I was a very active member on a site called metafilter.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a mechanism on Metafilter to share in a non-spammy way uh, what projects you were working on. So I, I shared, oh, I'm starting a site about personal finance. And uh, the members of that community came and they helped at the very beginning, they helped spread the word. and. Um, by doing this, by leveraging my existing online relationships, and not, again, in a non-spammy way, just in a natural way, uh, the site was able to grow. And because people liked, I still don't know why people like what I write, but because they liked what I was writing, and especially about money, um, they spread the word and people came and they stayed and it just grew from there. So I think it's really cool the way that you started off with a, with a community of readers that followed you and you, st you sort of helped provide value to, to this community offer things that they wanted to see and they sort of organically helped you grow. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit like about the, like how, how is the speed of growth? That's interesting to me. Cause like the way that I've seen it happen is that people will put in two, three, four years of work and then suddenly something happens right. and they explode. Did you have any explosive point or was it kind of linear growth? No, there were, it kind of grew in fits and starts and it still grows in fits and starts. Um, within a couple of months, it started on April 15th, I guess it was by the end of June, I had a couple of thousand readers, a couple of thousand subscribers. 
which having started some blogs since then, I would love if those blogs could get to a couple of thousand subscribers. I'm, I tend to get to about five or 600 and install. Uh, but then D Dig was very big back then. Dig was huge. And I didn't know about Dig until one day at the end of June, I had posted some article about something inconsequential. I don't even remember what it was. And I was out mowing the lawn and like many bloggers, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an obsessive stats tracker. I, I just track my stats all the time. And uh, I've been getting a few hundred hits a day and I came in from mowing the lawn and I'd had a few thousand in the past hour. I was like, holy cats, what is going on? Where, where did thousands come from? I don't get thousands. And uh, uh, from that point on, that brought a few other readers that were influential and from that point on, it would grow in fits and starts. Every time that the site got on Dig, the readership would grow by a few hundred or a thousand subscribers. Uh, and then uh, very soon, I got my first media mention in the New York Times, and that brought some subscribers. Although media mentions, a, a lot of vloggers, they really want to get into uh, outside media. They want to get in uh, television or radio or newspaper. And from my experience, that's not really a great way for growth because mm -hmm. You want to get mentioned on uh, big internet sites because internet readers are reading on the internet. Mm -hmm. If the people are listening on the radio, they're not going to go to your site. They're not going to take the time to type no, it in. Th th you might get one or two readers from my experience. But did you start using, for example, you see on a lot of bloggers' pages, they'll add like on the top right section a list of all the media that they've been in. So it'll say featured in the New York Times, right. featured in ABC. Um, did you do anything like that with after your New York Times post? No, 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 I didn't. Uh, it took me a long, long time to create a media page. And uh, even now, I think now I do have something up there. Uh, well, the Time Magazine thing is up there for sure. But um, no, it, it took forever. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, uh, that's an interesting point. But, uh, but I, I think it's good to do it though. Just because I didn't do it, I mean, again, I'm the world's worst marketer, so. I mean, it's interesting that you say the world's worst marketer when you told me last night you have something like hundreds of thousands of uniques a month, so you can't be that bad of a marketer. Um, but it sounds to me like you weren't doing marketing so much as just trying to provide value that your readers actually wanted. Yeah. And so even when you were getting on Dig, um, when you were getting on, I'm assuming you were on Reddit a few times and yeah, sites like yeah. that, did you ever like actively write articles you thought would get to those sites? Yes. I mean, for a time, I think everyone was getting sucked into the idea. And I think many bloggers still do get sucked into the idea that, oh, I need to write to try to get picked up by a big site, mm -hmm. uh, a Dig or a Reddit or... Uh, whatever and to be honest that was never ever successful I think there was one time that I wrote an article that was specifically aimed at dig it was called lifestyles of the rich and stupid it was an April 1st article about people who had earned a lot of money and then squandered it away <laughs> and that one went big on dig and it was specifically aimed at dig but that was the only one that I ever tried to do that actually worked okay but uh, did you ever try to do any that failed yeah, I did many that, yeah, uh, yeah I, I spent all this time crafting these big lists of whatever, <laughs> like 20 ways to make $10,000 in a year or whatever. 25 ways that yeah. dig is better than Reddit. <laughs> and those never worked. I mean, it just failed. And then I'd come in and uh, from a day at the office and I'd have some mundane article. I can't think of an example right now, like how I drive a 13 year old car and it saves me all this money or whatever mm -hmm. and it would have gone big on dig and I'm like so eventually I just gave up I thought you know it's silly to put all my energy into trying to uh, create these articles that are going to go big on dig when they don't and even if they were to they're the kind of articles that, that they're not going to bring readers back to the site where something about driving a 13 year old car that might bring somebody back to the site because it provides actual value and it's a, it's a story again that people can relate to I had, a, I had a similar experience with my blog. I launched it. Uh, I launched a few articles a few weeks ago, and I, I, I wrote a bunch of articles that I thought would be amazing posts. And, yeah. And then I wrote one just like quick article, seven reasons why you should move to Berlin. I just wrote a one night, just took me 15, maybe 25 minutes or something. That article hit it huge on Hacker News. I was super, super happy about that. Uh, I had like you know, 10,000 uniques on the first post I put nice. on the site. And then I also had put an email subscribe form, and it turned out that I got 10 email addresses from the the, the 10,000 uniques and only four of the people actually confirmed on the click oh. so I was like this is interesting traffic because really I'm not actually capturing these people they're just coming right. in seeing and then disappearing um, and so do you ever have a method for like capturing any viewers that come to your site 
or is it mostly through RSS and people passively clicking the button that you put on the side? It's, it's passive. And again, this is an example of me not doing a good enough job. I feel like, and I've had many people tell me this, that I, I get rich slowly uh, underperforms because I don't do certain things. And I realize that. And it's been very successful regardless of that. And I'm very thankful for that. But uh, I feel like it could, we could have more subscribers. We could uh, have more visitors. We could make more money if we did some of these other things. Mm -hmm. And why don't I do them? I, I don't know because I don't well, know. It just doesn't fit who I am or, or what I do. So, yeah. but but there are certain things like uh, I think now there's a, a subscription prod at the end of every post, and mm -hmm. I think that's good. And, and that's, that's via RSS. I think this is actually via email. Oh, okay, you have an email. You'd think I would know this, wouldn't you? No, no, no. <laughs> my technical elves. I, I, for my side, I always talk about the uh, advertising elves and the technical elves and the social media elves. Elves. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> these are the people behind the scenes that take care of these things. And I focus on the content because really that's what I'm about. And mm -hmm. what I, I'm a writer. At my heart, inside, I'm a writer. I want to tell stories. I want to help people. And uh, this other stuff, the business stuff, I can do it, but it's not what I want to do. Mm-hmm. I've been finding the same issue with my blog in that like I thought that blogging would be spending most of my time writing and then at the end of the day I spend maybe 20% of the time writing and most yeah. of the time is spent formatting a post, dealing with uh, social media mentions, responding yeah. to comments. Yeah. Um, how do you figure out a way to, how did you find a way to like focus on what you really love to do with your blog? I haven't. I mean, okay, th that's a cop out. Um, it's a process. It's an ongoing process because if I want to write, and that's what I want to do is write, and the other things that we talked about, my learning Spanish, I mean, there are other things outside the blog that I want to do. Um, if I want to focus on the writing, I've got to find ways to, to delegate these other tasks, and it's, it's been a hard process, uh, because Get Rich Slowly was just me for so long that uh, it was hard for me to remove myself from it, and it was hard for the readers to accept the fact that no, it become more of a, a community blog uh, with multiple authors and other people doing things behind the scenes. It, it was a difficult process, and it's an ongoing process. Uh, so for me, finding ways, like bringing on staff writers, bringing on an assistant editor, bringing on somebody who's going to take care of the social media, to take finding people who can do these things so that I don't have to, has been very key so that I can focus my attention on the writing, which is what I love to do. Mm -hmm. I, that's awesome. Um, this reminds me of like a sort of blog post on brainstorming, which is about um, building a system instead of trying to fight against the things that you don't want to do. Exactly. You build a system that allows you to just focus on what you do and just yep. let somebody else handle the rest. And, and, and that's tough because I think that so many times we're taught in the uh, in this culture, in the American culture, that you know you you got to buckle down and do the the stuff that you don't want to do. And, and it's true, you do have to do that sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you are in a position where you're able to delegate or able to uh, take the responsibilities that don't appeal to you, that don't bring you happiness, that you don't enjoy, that you don't want to do, absolutely do what you can to just focus on your strengths. Um, actually, I think it was, we talked about Tim Ferriss a little bit, and I think in the four hour work week, it's where uh, he talked about how he had decided to focus only on his strengths instead of doing all these things that he's not particularly good at to focus specifically on his strengths and ignore the rest and he had amazing results and so that's what I did or what I'm trying to do and I found the same thing when you focus on your strengths you get outstanding results instead of spending all this time trying to build up your weaknesses instead of spending and a thousand hours on ten different tasks, spend ten thousand hours on what you want to do and yeah. become an expert at it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I believe that that is truly the way to focus on any sort of task you want to get good at. And people tend, a lot of times in American society, you're exactly right, people think that they have to push through and do exactly what they don't want to do. And people don't realize there's other ways around it these days. Yeah, and, and you just brought up, I'm going to go on a tangent here, you brought up something just tangentially there, you didn't actually mention it, but uh, one important thing, people want to know all the time how to get rich slowly, get successful. Uh, what, what's the key to success? And I will admit that I've been very fortunate. I've, I've had some people uh, read the site who are influential. Um, I've got some people who noticed it and mentioned in the media. That's great. Uh, but I've also put in a lot of work. I put a hell of a lot of work into the site. And I still do. Uh, there were times where I put in 80 hours a week into the site and uh, do that for months at a time, sacrificing other things in my life and uh, that's a huge contributing factor. If you put in the work, 
you're gonna have much greater odds of being successful. So putting in the work isn't a guarantee of success. There are a lot of great bloggers out there who put in 80 hours a week and nobody ever notices. Mm -hmm. But I think you maximize the possibility that you will achieve success if you do the work. Necessary but not sufficient sort of thing. You gotta yeah. do the work but not enough. But what do you think is the sufficient factor? So like, there's no factor that was gonna make anybody successful. There's a lot of parts to it. There's probably you know yeah. the niche you choose, the amount of work you put in, the amount of uh, the, the type of people you network with. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering what sort of like, from your for your individual blog posts and for your site as a whole. Let's start with your individual blog posts. What kind of stories or what kind of what kind of topic or what kind of framework do the most successful stories from your blog, uh, most successful blog posts from your blog have? That's an interesting question. Um, I think, again, most of the most successful stories or, or blog posts at Get Rich Slowly and at my other blogs have been the ones that do tell stories. And I'm a huge proponent of, of story. I, I spoke recently at uh, FinCon, the first financial bloggers conference, and uh, my speech was specifically about how we need to tell stories. Mm -hmm. we, we need to be we need to provide services for the readers and one of the best ways to do that is to tell stories because that's what helps people understand and relate to their own lives. So um, for me the most successful posts from my experience are the ones that come from the heart where I'm passionate. If I'm scared about publishing a post because I think it's too personal that's usually a good sign. It's a sign that's going to be well received and that it's going to uh, get a lot of uh, uh, traffic not just traffic, but it's going to help a lot of people. I'm going to give an example here. Uh, was it two years ago or three? I can't even It's almost three years now. Uh, in January of uh, 2009, uh, my best friend, who I'd known for many years since high school, he committed suicide. And uh, I didn't know, I didn't know, do I mention this on the blog? How do I handle this? Because it was very raw. I mean... I was devastated. It, it changed a lot of who I am and what I've been doing over the past three years, this one thing. And uh, so I took a week off, and then I came back, and I wrote about it. And it was a very raw post, and I was nervous about putting it up there, uh, but it was very well received. Now, a suicide is an extreme example, mm -hmm. but um, there are all sorts of other posts where I, I, I write them, and I, I put them up, and I'm like, is that too personal? Are people going to rip me apart? Are they thinking I'm sharing too much? And almost every time, those are the articles that uh, achieve the most success. Interesting. How do, you, how do you frame these story articles? So, for example, I today was reading The New Yorker, uh -huh. and the way that The New Yorker frames a story is just out of this world amazing. Like, Malcolm Gladwell or any of the writers from The New Yorker, they, they, they start, like, I read an article today about Occupy Wall Street, uh -huh. and it starts off with this... I'm a computer. It starts off with this computer programmer who lives in, in New who lives in Seattle. Starts losing his clients, loses another client. Then one of his, his main client dies. He has no more jobs. He has to sell his Final Cut Pro Studio. He has to sell his laptop. And then he notices he starts hearing about the Wall Street Journal. So he decides to get on a Greyhound bus and just make it there and huh. just join the Occupy Wall Street movement. And then they use that to frame the whole Occupy Wall Street format. And it's like probably almost a third or a quarter of the article is the story leading up to the actual point, which is about Occupy Wall Street. But the story is it's what makes you relate to it, right? It's the what draws you in. And there's no, there's no way I would have gotten to paragraph 10 if I hadn't read yeah. the first nine. Um, and another example is This American Life, which does Absolutely. the best stories I've ever heard in radio. Yeah. How do you go about framing a story in these sort of situations? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't have one way that I approach it. Uh, to me, each story and each article is different. So if I'm writing about uh, travel, for example, I like to travel, and we'll probably get to that here, um, or how to budget for travel, I might start by saying, okay, I've recently been to Peru, these are the things I did to save for the trip, this is the mo how I spent the money. Uh, but if I'm talking about my mortgage, for example, I might start the story instead. I might lead with the, uh, okay, the different people say different things about mortgages. Some people say you should pay them off early. Some say you should carry a uh, low interest rate for a long time, on and on. And then go in and talk about the details of what I do. So each story is going to be different. Mm -hmm. And there's no one right way to do it. Okay. That makes sense. What about, uh, what about like, do you ever think about hooks or like ways to intro or outro that you think will bring in the most viewers? Or uh, is it sort of just the way that you feel writing? It For me... We talked about this last night. I'm not a very good planner. Mm -hmm. I, it, a lot of what I do is just spontaneous. And so that goes for the writing too. Um, 
it, when I'm done with an article, I will go back and I will spend time trying to figure out, is there a better way to intro it? Is there a better way to get people in? Because those first few sentences, the first couple of paragraphs, those are key. You want to get the people hooked and reading the article. Mm -hmm. But I've also found that if I try to spend too much time, in, in my instance, or for my case, if I spend too much time trying to do this, I actually overthink it and I kill the article. Okay. And it deadens it. So, again, each person's different. At Get Rich Slowly, my motto is do what works for you. Mm -hmm. By which I mean everyone is different, everyone has different strengths, everyone has different weaknesses, and uh, you've got to figure out methods that are effective in your own life. And so, it's the same is true with writing, or anything. With writing especially, yeah. Tell me if this resonates with you, because I've had the same situation happen to me a lot. Um, I'll spend hours and hours trying to plan my intro to the writing, and eventually I'm like, this is dumb, uh, let me just use this intro, and then I'll start paragraph three. Paragraph three flows out of my mind easily, paragraph four, five, six, seven, everything's good, and then I'm like, the intro was lame, let me go back and fix that, and yep. I completely delete the first two paragraphs, yep, and just yep. redo it. Yep, yep. I've noticed that sometimes just jumping into things gets the most successful articles. Okay, yes, th this is a great point, Manish. Uh, absolutely. When, and so I've taken many creative writing classes, and one of the things we were taught is, instead of sitting down and trying to write whatever it is you think you want to write, you just start writing, you just free write, because sometimes you don't know where you're going to go. You just start, it doesn't have to be the beginning, and eventually, and this is almost always the case, eventually you will reach a point where you realize, oh, I've got an actual article here, or I've got a story here, and I can lop out these first five paragraphs I wrote, which are related to nothing, and uh, start it here. Now, and I'll, I'll use another example from Get Rich Slowly. I publish a lot from staff writers now, and from uh, readers, uh, guest posts, uh, reader stories, and that kind of thing. And uh, so I've done a lot of editing. Most of my work now at Get Rich Slowly is editing rather than writing. And so often, I would say, 30, 40, 50% of the time, I just lop off the first paragraph of whatever anybody gave me because their first paragraph is junk. Mm -hmm. And uh, people don't realize it's junk, but so many times you can throw away the first paragraph or maybe the first couple of sentences, whatever it is, and the story is stronger because of it. I just published, the story I published uh, on Sunday was a story from a woman uh, whose father had recently died and she was uh, talking about estate planning and so on. And uh, she had an intro paragraph but it didn't have any information in it, so I just yanked it out. Mm -hmm. And starting where I started made the story much more powerful. That makes sense. Drunk and white, sort of like write only what's necessary. And yeah, yeah, yeah. More. Yeah, and that's kind of like metaphorical for any kind of situation you're doing. It's like just start doing it and figure it out and fix it later, right? Wait, yes. <laughs> this is actually another thing I've learned. Yes, you, you just got to do action. I say, uh, what is one? I, I have these uh, 15, 16... Uh, tenets of Get Rich Slowly, that, that my, my personal finance philosophy, and it's actually my life philosophy just applied to money. And uh, one of them is uh, the trite old actions are more important than words. Because so, uh, so many people talk about doing things, they talk that they want to do that, they want to start a blog, they want to write a book, they want to lose weight, whatever. But talking doesn't accomplish anything, you've actually got to do it. I get this situation with all my students from my online marketing masterclass. Like, they basically will sign up, they'll pay a ton of money, and they'll, they'll take this class that I really really provides a lot of value. But the right. thing is they just want to keep absorbing all the information. I'm like, don't even go to module two yet. Just read, watch module one, watch the first video, and then do something, anything. Yeah. Um, I've actually been thinking maybe I should just not allow them to get access to the rest of it until they do something, you know? <laughs> so you, you, and I, you and I have been talking about uh, Spanish because I'm learning Spanish. I've been learning Spanish for five months now. And uh, I just took a trip to Peru. When I went to Peru, at the start of the trip, I'd only been taking Spanish for three months. And I went down there. I was with a group of uh, 14, 15, 16 other people, most of them from Australia. Uh, some of them knew Spanish better than I did. But they wouldn't, they wouldn't talk Spanish. They, they were scared to go out and use their Spanish. And here, I don't know Spanish very well, but I was going out and talking with the people in the markets and in the restaurants and actually trying to use my Spanish because because of what I've learned from Get Rich Slowly about actions being so much more important than words. And uh, I know I looked like a fool going out in the market, but that's okay. The, the people liked it. They liked selling me the bracelets. and they, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was fun. It was fun to use my Spanish and, and to actually act. And it's true in all aspects of life. Actually taking those first steps and doing something is so much more important than just talking about it. Very true. Extremely true. Um, I want to get back to, uh, to how you grew your blog. Okay. As well yeah. as so, you told me a little bit about how you were building each post up to to growing into a like 
the kind of hooks you use and the kind of paragraphs you used. From your blog perspective, what do you think were like the big changes? Like what were the big, what were like, for, for me and for most people I've met, like there's like those individual posts the time they got on the Wall Street Journal or the time that like they were on TV or whatever happened that really affected the growth. Right. Um, was there anything that you that you remember that was a huge jump in the way, in both your understanding of the blog world and also in the growth of your blog? I'm trying to think. I know there are absolutely some key moments financially in the financial growth of the blog. I'm trying to think as far as readership. Is financial concerned. growth is great. Let's start with that. Okay, so not only am I the world's worst marketer, but I was also very poor at monetization with Get Rich Slowly. Uh, I didn't understand the power that uh, monetization could have to generate income. And so when the blog started and uh, the growth began to occur, I, I had AdSense up and I had some Amazon links and that was about it. And I didn't realize that there were other affiliate programs. And I don't just mean affiliates where somebody's selling an ebook and you sign it up to be a partner with that. But I mean things like uh, uh, Linkshare or uh, Commission Junction where you can go and there's a marketplace for big national companies that want to partner with bloggers or other websites uh, to market their products. I didn't realize that these things existed. And so uh, I had some articles that I had written that had generated a lot of traffic um, they could have had com uh, uh, affiliate links in them. And I didn't know the affiliate links existed. I wouldn't have known how to use them. And uh, another blogger came to me and said, JD, why don't you put some affiliate links in these things, in these articles? And so I did. And uh, it was a revelation. My income, <laughs> it uh, quintupled, maybe even went up by 10 times just overnight. Because, overnight. Yes. Yeah. Because the most highly trafficked articles on the site all of a sudden had a way to generate revenue, whereas they didn't before. And uh, so that was a huge revelation. Um, also, figuring out how to... Uh, I'm not very good at testing uh, ad placement. Uh, I have never really done much with it. But one day I decided, you know, my uh, AdSense ads, they're not doing as well as I think they ought to based on how many people I have. And so I started just messing around, moving them around, and I'd leave them for a week and... It's just kind of an informal test, nothing fancy like your brother or me does, but uh, just uh, kind of an informal test. And I found that, oh, I can double the performance of an AdSense ad by moving it around from one place to another. And I'd talk to other bloggers and they're like, yeah, that's why we have our ads on the left side instead of the right side. And uh, uh, some bloggers said, uh, you know, I've got this, I used to have this one vertical line that separated the ad from the, the main body of the content. And I removed that line and my, uh, it went up 30 or 40%. Yeah, like really one line affects it. It's, yeah, so testing is important. Uh, understanding what kind of monetization is appropriate for your site. For my site, for a long time, I would not have credit card ads because I was vehemently anti credit cards, and so are most of my readers. Um, and so to have credit cards ads just would have been wrong. And the site has evolved and it's changed. So now credit cards they're okay. I mean, mm -hmm. um, they're okay for me. I understand that. Uh, for a long time, I couldn't have a credit card because I was bad with debt, bad with them, and I was deep in debt. Uh, now, though, I've had a credit card again for four years and have always paid it off. It's not an issue. So, anyway, yeah, you, you, you've got to understand your 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 readership, and you've got to understand what works for you and what kind of products are good to market. Credit cards is an interesting topic. Let's let's tangent onto that for a minute, because right, sure. you know that my my view on credit cards is I love them. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> uh, I'm a, I'm one of the Chris Gillibo aficionados. Uh, uh, where basically it's just buy, get as many credit cards as you can, get the miles, and always right. pay it off. Do you uh, do you find that? I found that I I would give this advice to a lot of people, and people are afraid to apply for new credit cards or whatnot, because of, granted, if you don't pay it off, it's a very bad thing. Um, have you found that a lot of your readers? when you started switching to a credit card, do you ever talk about how you use credit cards on your site? Yeah, yeah. And do your readers often apply for new cards that you recommend or anything like that? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't do it often. I'm still hesitant to uh, uh, write articles about specific credit cards. I have done it, and Chris Gillibo is a good example. Uh, at a planning meeting for his conference, the World Domination Summit, last April, he was mentioning this uh, British Airways credit card that had this offer, and if you... Signed up for it, you got 50,000 air miles, and if you charged a certain amount within a certain period of time, you got another 50,000 miles. And I've never paid attention to air miles, so, <laughs> but I thought, I said, 100,000 miles, what does that get you? And he told me, and it's like something, something like two round trip tickets in the US or something like that. I was like, wow, free, wow. And 
so I signed up for the car and I did this and I would jump through the hoops and now I have like 125,000 air miles. <laughs> but, uh, so I wrote about that card and, uh, and I think I've written about one other card since. Uh, the readers don't really, really like that at Get Rich Slowly. Some other blogs, that's fine. It, it, it's fine for them to do it. But Get Rich Slowly is a little bit hesitant. But they don't seem to mind ads in the sidebar for credit cards. Mm -hmm. Or there's a credit card finder page at Get Rich Slowly some people use. And so. so when you have these like blog posts which readers don't tend to like as much, do you tend to get more comments or do you get more views on the ones that actually promote a little bit of like a fight between your readers? No. It, the only one who ever notices there's a fight going on are the regular readers. And mm -hmm. so if, if there's a, a, a post that's got some sort of discussion or debate, the regular readers will notice it. Anybody outside is not going to really understand that there's that's going on. Um, I get email from readers who will say, why did you post this? Why did you post about credit, this credit card offer? Or I'll get uh, the comments themselves, people will complain. Yeah, the, the commenters at Get Rich Slowly, the community at Get Rich Slowly is amazing. It's just outstanding. Uh, Instead of having snipey comments, it's almost all just uh, interested people, educated people, having discussions and trying to help each other. And so when it descends into a, this is stupid type thing, I, I, I kind of tend to listen because it's out of character and... Mm, okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting because sometimes I see a lot of bloggers try to promote a kind of a debate. They try to talk about. They try to build like a build like a, a debate going on in the comments so that they get people who are like, well, "Let me check out the site more. I gotta read through it." No, you know, I think that if if there were often debates, if there was on, often controversy, yeah, maybe that would draw some people to come back and look for the controversy. But then, what's the purpose of your site? Is it to court people who are looking for controversy, or is it to actually help people and provide information? And for me, I want to help people and provide information, so. I don't need the arguments in the comments. They make me tense. <laughs> it sounds to me that you're like, you were mentioning last night that you see two different spheres of bloggers yeah. and that you see yourself in the middle. Um, I think that's an interesting point. Can you talk about that a little yeah. bit? Yeah, well, th there are actually, there's all sorts of different ways to classify bloggers. And in this case, I was saying that uh, uh, there are certain bloggers who are, I call them old school, and they're more about providing content, telling stories, sharing links, and they'll do almost no advertising. I won't say they won't, they don't avoid advertising completely, but they might have AdSense or just one small ad and they're never gonna do marketing. They're not, never gonna have affiliate links. They, they just don't do this stuff. In fact, many of them are opposed to it because uh, they think it's wrong. They, they think it's uh, 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 violating ethics. And then there are other people who think, no way, man. Uh, you should do whatever you can to get the most money you can out of your site, and that means affiliate link. That means affiliate links, uh, banner ads, pop up ads, whatever. Do that, and uh, obviously those are extremes of the uh, scale. I mean, the the extreme over here would be we're not going to have ads at all, and all ads are bad. And I used to be like that. I used to think that. Now I fall someplace in the middle. I can understand what the old school type uh, people are thinking, where the the marketing or the affiliate links uh, are scammy or whatever. I get that, but I also see the other side where, you know, you gotta make a living, and if you're making a living, if, if you're spending all your time writing this content, you've gotta find a way to uh, generate uh, revenue from it. And uh, I think there's a balance to be had, and the balance is different for each person. Some people, they're okay with the, the marketing and the affiliate links. Uh, some people aren't. You just gotta find what works for you. Definitely. Uh, you were mentioning before that your blog monetization strategy exploded when you got affiliate links or mm -hmm. when you, you removed the vertical bar. Um, and you, you said it was based depending on the type of audience that you have. And I think that's really interesting. Uh, some, a lot of, uh, some people have been seeing, for example, um, the product launch formula product by, uh, but there's a, there's a formula, there's this, uh, there's a information product called the product launch formula by Jeff Walker. Okay. That was, that's one of the most famous information products. But the funny thing is if you sign up to his email list, it's like you're getting hit over the head with a sledgehammer all the time about sales for this product. And the reason why is because this guy is getting all of his traffic is being funneled in through other affiliates. So he doesn't care if you stay on the list or not. All he's trying to do is just get a sale immediately. Oh. Where, so he's allowed to go ahead and, and just, no, he's not spamming. He's just continuously sending out tomorrow, sure, sure, which sure. going to be for sale because he doesn't mind. Whereas for you, you want to build a, a, a base of followers who continue to stay there. Correct. I, I'm trying to build long-term relationships. That's what mm -hmm. I'm trying to do. So from your perspective, um, you've seen affiliate links that you recommend and actually recommend yes. have been effective. Um, 
and you said that a little bit of AdSense or credit card recommendations have been okay. Uh, have you seen any other great blog monetization strategies that would be effective for people with your situation? Uh, for my situation, I still think that uh, in, in, an information product would work for me if I were to put if I were to sit down and craft uh, an ebook and publish an ebook. I think that could be a fairly lucrative way uh, to generate revenue. I haven't done that, but uh, it's something that I'm looking at for the future. Uh, I think there are so many different ways to monetize that each person's got to look at their own individual strengths, what they like to do, and also base it on their audience. Uh, we've mentioned Chris Gillibo a couple times. He's a good friend. He's here in Portland also. And uh, for him, all he does is information products. He doesn't sell anything else. He doesn't, he doesn't do affiliate links. He doesn't do any of this other stuff. All he does is his information products. And it works great for him and he's able to make a living off it, and he's able to travel the world because of this. And, uh, but I couldn't get by with just a pure information product standpoint. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know many people who could. Okay, okay, cool. So let's talk a little bit about money, uh, since you're the money expert. All right. How do you... Uh... The accidental money expert, I'll point out. <laughs> it's kind of how it happens, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Every side that has the word rich in it ends up being about <laughs> money, right? So. <laughs> What would you, what do you say for like, for like people who are in credit card debt or people who are just out of credit card debt or especially for people who are like in their 20s and just leaving college and mm -hmm. are, you know, maybe have student loans but mm -hmm. don't have too much debt um, outside of student loans. How would you say that they should be setting up their finances? Let's talk about this more from a strategic perspective. So like, well, I have to tell you that your brother Ramit and I actually agree on a lot of things and you know he's huge on automation and I think automation is absolutely essential when you're starting out uh, because it puts you in a position where you can't you can't short circuit yourself you, you can't cheat yourself and uh, put yourself back in the hole so when I say automation is key what I mean by that is uh, have your paychecks automatically deposited to your pay uh, to, to your bank account uh, find a, a online savings account like ING direct or, or wherever uh, have your paycheck automatically deposited there. Have your bills automatically uh, routed or paid from that savings account. And uh, set up automatic investing. I'm a huge fan of automatic investing. Uh, using things like ShareBuilder or I think Schwab even lets you do some automatic investing. Mm -hmm. um, so that you're, you're not spending the money on other things but it's getting invested automatically for you before you have a chance to decide, oh, I wanna go out and uh, go skiing this weekend or whatever, you, you take care of the important things first. And then, after you've set up all these automation systems, uh, then I, I said to put everything, have it automatically go into your savings account, then I think it's okay to have it like an automated payment that comes to your checking account. And once it comes to your checking account, that's your money to spend. So it's almost as if you are a bill, uh, your, your fun stuff is a bill that has to be paid every month too. <laughs> You're paying yourself into your checking account for uh, whatever it is you want to do. Now, I know a lot of people are going to be like, wow, I can't do that. But I think that this is the ideal situation. Uh, if I had a kid, if I had a son who was just, or a daughter who was just graduated from college, I'd, I'd encourage them to do this, to set up the, the automatic thing going into the savings account and then from the savings account to everywhere else, including your checking account. This is one of those things that I, when I hear people who aren't doing this, I'm like, really? There are people who don't have automatic investing? Because I've been doing it for so long and it's yeah. just the most effective thing I've ever done. Yeah. Adding a you know just a hundred bucks a month that automatically transfers into my camera fund, for example. Yeah. Oh. It's, oh. Okay. That's targeted savings, and yeah, I'm all over that. Yeah, I do that through ING Direct, which is. Yeah. Um, I'm, do you use ING for? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. ingdirect.com is a great bank that I recommend, and um, yeah. and my brother does too. And it's like just every 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 month, you know, I have a hundred bucks going into camera, a yeah. hundred bucks going into DJ gear, or whatever. And suddenly, after a year, I have you know fifteen hundred bucks or twelve hundred bucks yep. just sitting in an account waiting for a camera, and it's. And it's a, it's a great situation. For me, that's what I do for my travel fund. I have a travel fund. Uh, I have a used car. I bought a used Mini Cooper. I would like a new Mini Cooper or maybe a less used. And uh, so I have money that goes in the Mini Cooper fund. It keeps getting routed to travel. I mean, you can that do that. Happens. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> certain things are more of a priority. And for me, travel is more important than a car. Um, uh, yeah, these automatic targeted accounts. Some people say, why would you do that? Why don't you just use a spreadsheet? Well, if you can do it with a spreadsheet, do it with a spreadsheet. My, my wife, she uses a, a spreadsheet. She know, uh, she's listed all the different things she wants to do and she knows how much she has in her savings account and she knows what's targeted for what. But the more you can uh, 
make it so you don't have to think about it, I think the easier it is to do. You, you take yourself out of the equation. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, but I'm the weakest link in my financial system. <laughs> and so if I'm able to, to uh, uh, make it automated, yeah. Every decision you make like requires willpower, and every every decision yeah. you make is more difficult. We were talking yesterday about this uh, about this uh, this experiment I read, where uh, every they tested your glucose levels, and yeah. after you make one decision that requires willpower, it's difficult to make the next one. If you can just remove yourself from the situation, it's often a much better situation. Yeah, I like to use also my ING records to look at what I cared about in the past. So I look at my wow. old my old sub accounts from like 2005 or 2006 and I'm like, oh, I really, really cared about traveling to Norway at this time. I just, where did that go? <laughs> yeah, see, I, I haven't had my accounts long enough to uh, be able to do that. And plus, they've pretty much all been the same thing. Mini Cooper, <laughs> travel. Gets, uh, before I uh, bought the used Mini Cooper, I had to save for it too. So I've had mm -hmm. my Mini Cooper account for a while. Definitely. So let's talk a little bit about travel since that seems to be really on your mind these days. <laughs> uh, how did that happen? You know, I don't know how that started really. I guess uh, in 2007, uh, my wife and I went with her sister and her parents. We went to England and Ireland. Uh, her parents paid for a trip. And I loved it. It was the first time I had been outside the US and Canada. It was my first time outside the North America, basically. And it was fantastic. And so I thought, all right, uh, I'd like to do some more of this. And uh, so I thought about it for a while. Uh, I finished, when I finished my book, I got an advance on the book. Not a huge amount, but enough. Uh, finished the book and I said, you know, maybe I can use some of this money to travel. So uh, my wife and I, we decided, as soon as the book is turned into the editor, we're going to Belize, which is in Central America. We went to Central America. Uh, Belize is great because they use the dollar for their currency. They speak English, that's their language. And uh, it's a former British colony. Um, we had a great time and it just planted this seed. And so now I've been to uh, Italy and France, Southern Africa, just got back from five weeks in Peru and Bolivia. It was uh, fantastic. And every time I travel, I just want to travel more. <laughs> I, I love uh, seeing how other people live. I love meeting other people. And I just love experiencing the cultures. Travel isn't for everyone. Not everyone enjoys it, but I do. There's this feeling though, when you go to another place and you're like, oh my God, there's so much more. Like. There's people who speak different languages, yeah. there's different lifestyles that people have. And to me, I was aware, people always say, oh yeah, travel changes you, and you realize that there's more than just your, your little part of the world. And I knew that going into it. I'm a pretty open-minded guy. I mean, I read a lot, I, and uh, still, you're right. To actually experience it is a very different thing, to, to understand how people live and how people can be happy in different situations and uh, it's just something we don't get in the United States. We're so isolated. We, we only think about ourselves and our history is so short and our memory is so short. We don't, as a nation, our collective memory only goes back 10 or 20 years. It, it hardly goes back further than that except for the big events that we talk about like JFK's assassination or whatever. Uh, but other countries have memories that go back hundreds of years. They have histories that are just rich and vibrant and everything is all around you and uh, People are so different, they do different things, and they're happy, and they don't think about the United States, they don't care about the United States, and it's a, I don't think Americans get it. We, a lot of times we're so wrapped up in our own country and our own lives, we just think we're awesome, and it's... It's true, we do think we're awesome. Yeah, I know. You hear it a lot. Um, but how do you, how do you travel? Do you travel more in like a, like a um, backpacker lifestyle, or do you travel more with like luxury hotels, or which do you prefer? How do I, tra how have I traveled, or how, how do I want to travel? Both. All right. So in the past, um, a lot of what we've done has been, uh, or a lot of what I've done has been almost luxury travel. It's not high-end luxury travel, but it's, it's tourism, and it's, it's isolated, it's staying in nice hotels, it's, it's taking bus tours, it's not getting out and being with the people. And uh, that's what I needed to start. That's what I needed to start because I was a little bit timid and scared. Now though, this last trip to Peru, uh, there were, I was with a tour group, but it was a, with a, a, a tour group that specifically was getting in and hiking and uh, being with the people. I spent a few days on my own, uh, and then I did a, a few more tours in Lima where we were, uh, they were actually on the ground, and it's not removed, mm -hmm. and I like that. Uh, what I would like to do now 
and what I'm hoping to do in the next couple of years is actually maybe spend some extended time, like take three, three months, go back to Peru, go back to Cusco, Peru, which I love, and rent an apartment and just spend some time learning Spanish and living there and actually being a part of the culture and seeing what that is like. Uh, that's what I would love to do. The, the, the difference between a three week trip and a three to four month trip is enormous, especially like is when it? you get that apartment and when you get like those people, who, the, the cafe, the waiters who, re who recognize you and remember yeah. your order and there's just this feeling of having made a difference in a, in a, in a culture, like yeah. actually having an effect on a town. It's amazing. I hope I can convince you at some point to go to Buenos Aires or go to Medellin, Colombia, because after Cusco, you got to check out those places. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> Great. Um, and so I think that's. Uh, oh, I'll, before we before we stop, let's talk a little bit about language learning, since it seems like you're talking right, right, into right. Spanish. Um, I was pretty right, see, muy, muy bien. <laughs> I was pretty impressed yesterday. We went out. Um, we went out to we went out to Starbucks and we chatted a little bit in Spanish. And for most, your Spanish is very good for Thank most you. Americans. And how did you? You've only done it five months without really spending that much time in another country, uh, just practicing the language. How did you get to that point? Um, well, we talked earlier about how uh, hard work is important. Uh, I've done a lot of I've done a lot of hard work. Uh, so for me, you know, I tried to learn a language when I was younger, uh, but I wasn't very motivated, and I never got anywhere with it. I spent four years on German in high school and college, and basically don't remember any of it. Uh, and I think a lot of people are like that. They take it because it's required. Uh, but for some reason, something just lit a fire in me this last June, and I decided, okay, I'm going to learn Spanish. I've talked about it, getting back to the action and words. I've talked about it for so long that instead of just talking about it, I want to do it. And so I was talking with uh, Benny Lewis from Fluent in Three Months, and he, I asked him, okay, Benny, I can afford to throw money at the problem, what's the best way to learn a language? He says, well, the best way is to go live in another country. I said, okay, what's the second best way? <laughs> he said, hire a tutor. And so I hired a tutor. I, I went on Craigslist and uh, I just answered a random ad and I sat down, I went to a coffee shop, met the woman, sat down at the table and I knew within seconds that I wanted to work with her because she, I could tell we were gonna relate very well and she was very patient with me. And so uh, what I've done is I've spent, for the past five months, uh, three days a week, 90 minutes of time at a time I meet with my tutor and uh, we don't talk completely in Spanish because I'm the weak link there <laughs> and uh, but we talk uh, about Spanish uh, we're reading books together we work on the grammar and so we just make this gradual progress and it's it's been awesome cool I think that buying a tutor, like renting, renting a tutor, I think hiring a tutor, <laughs> <laughs> hiring a tutor is a great way to learn a language. Whenever I've learned, uh, when I studied all of my languages, learning a tutor was a huge, uh, getting a tutor was a huge, huge jump because right. it's a, more about building that system. You build a system where you have to go show up because you're paying for it yeah. to actually force yourself to talk in a language. Whereas when you have a book or a workbook that you're writing in, you can always put it off for later. Right. You might not see it. Um, and I think that that is really, really useful advice for any sort of situation that you're really doing. Well, and I, I think it depends on the person, too, and your learning styles. For me, I, I was just talking with a friend this morning before I came up here. Uh, we were talking about the ways that I learn and the ways that uh, I do things. So uh, last night I mentioned that I've lost 50 pounds and that's through CrossFit. And that's because with CrossFit, I'm working one-on-one -on -one with the trainer. And... Uh, you do private training with the trainer. Well, it's not private. I mean, it's, 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 it's a small group. class. It's a small, small class. class. Yeah. yeah, and so my, my trainer, Cody, he's very aware of uh, where I am and what my strengths and weaknesses are, and he works with me. And so the same with the Spanish tutor. She knows what my strengths and weaknesses are, and she works with me. And uh, I've discovered about myself that I need this one-on-one -on -one attention. Uh, so I, I would like to learn a musical instrument, and so I'm probably going to take piano lessons and go uh, pay somebody to sit with me one-on-one. -on -one. I guess that's probably the only way you can do it, but it's another example of how I learn. And there are other people who learn great from books. I was talking with my friend this morning, and he's like, oh yeah, your wife, she tends to just, she wants to sit down and read the information, and that's how she's going to learn. She taught herself French by sitting down and doing Rosetta Stone. She doesn't need the tutor. I'm like, yeah, that's true. And so... There's different ways for different people. Yeah, you got, you've got it. It's so important to know yourself about uh, your writing style, about how you blog, about... Uh, how you learn, I think knowing yourself and being honest with yourself about what is effective, not what you wish was effective. I think so much of my life has been wasted because I do things that I would, or I make decisions based on how I wish I was or how, uh, how I want to be instead of how I really am. Learn who you are and then use that information to solve your problems. And, and that sounds like pat advice, but 
and it can be tough to figure out, but I think that if you can figure out who you are and what you need, yeah. Definitely. Well, J.D. Roth, thank you so much yeah, for so much. Uh, for joining us. This was really fun, guys. Yeah. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the interview, and um, we'll catch you soon. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.